JavaScript objects are a beautiful thing. And they are actually one of the reasons I fell in love with the JavaScript language. And you can do a lot of things with them. Whereas in other programming languages, there are specific data structures for doing, doing certain types of things. So things like hash maps or dictionaries, anything that's like an associative array. And the JavaScript object lets us implement and do all of those things with just the object. But there are certain scenarios where a JavaScript object maybe isn't the best choice. And in this video, we're gonna talk about that. Now, I'm not here to tell you to stop using objects. And I'm not here to tell you that maps and sets are the only thing you should be using when working in JavaScript, but we are gonna talk about specific scenarios where it makes sense to use a map or a set. Now, this video is gonna be a continuation of episode 689 of Syntax, where Wes and Scott were chatting about maps and sets. And specifically, Wes was giving some examples of where he's using maps in his code. So I'm gonna show you some code examples today and kind of walk you through the scenarios where it makes a lot of sense to use a map or a set versus an object. I'm CJ, welcome to Syntax. Now let's say for example, you have this books by ID object where all of the keys are the ID of the books and then all of the values are the books themselves. You might have a function get book that accepts the ID and then just returns that book at that specific ID. This will mostly work, but what you might not have considered is there are certain things that are on the book object because it inherits from the object prototype and if we, for example, say get book and we pass in the string constructor, that's going to return the object constructor and we don't want that. Um, and so this is the reason you typically, when you're doing this in a code base, you actually see some guarded checks around this access. So you might actually say if books by ID has own property. So this means does this object have this property and don't look up the prototype chain. And if it does, then we'll return that. And in this scenario, this will work. But there are some scenarios where you can actually create an object that doesn't inherit from the object prototype. And in that case, it won't have the has own property method. So you probably have seen this in code bases as well, where you have something like object dot prototype. So this grabs the has own property method from the object prototype itself. And then we want to call that on this specific object with that argument there. So you probably have seen this somewhere in a code base before. And the reason we do this is just to make sure that uh, when we're checking for properties to exist, we're only looking at the properties on the object itself, not the prototype chain. Now, if you have code like this in your code base, this is probably a really good use case for a map. Now in your code base, you probably don't have just a static object where all of the keys are already set like in your code. This is probably dynamically constructed based on some API response. Like you get back a list of books and then you build out this object so that way you can easily look up books by ID. If you're doing that, it's a perfect use case for a map. So let me show you how to use a map instead. So to create a map, we can use the map constructor. So let's say I have books by ID. We'll say new map. And now I have an instance of a map. Now there are a few methods on a map. So for instance, if we want to add something into the map, we can say books by ID dot set. We give it a key. In this case, I'll say the key is 42, and then we give it a value. Now this has added this specific book into the map with that key. Now, if we want to get it out, there's a couple of methods we can use. So books by ID now has the has method, and this will return true or false. So if I pass in 42, it returns true because that exists on the map. But if I pass in something that isn't in the map, it's going to return false. We can also get things out of the map. So maps have the get method and we can pass in a specific key. That'll give us back the thing. If we pass in a key that isn't in there, it's going to give back undefined. Now maps also support initializer syntax. So instead of having to call set, we actually can pass in an array of arrays where each array has keys and values. Let me show you what I mean. So for this map, we can pass in an array and then we can pass in a nested array where we have the key comma value. And so this is a nice convenient way of init like initializing a map with a bunch of keys and values. You basically just pass in these key value pairs. This should work in the same way. If we pass in 42, we're gonna get back that specific book. So let's actually construct this map using the book data that we had in the last example. So we have this object, the keys are the ID, the values are the books themselves. There is a built-in method on objects that will give us back an array of key and values. And that's what we can use in the initializer syntax. So if I hear say books by ID map, and then we try to create a map, I can use object.entries, pass in the existing object that we have, and this is gonna give us back a map. Check it out. However, 
you will notice one thing. The inferred key here is of type string. And when I define my object here, we define them as numbers. So we think. Uh, but that's that's not actually the case. So when you define objects, the keys are always strings no matter what. So behind the scenes, when this object got initialized, all of these keys, even though I specified them as numbers, they actually got coerced to strings. And so to see that in action, if I pull out books by ID at the number 42, that gives me back Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But if I pass in the string 42, we get back the same thing. And so this is actually one of the benefits of maps is that they will use a specific type for the key, whereas objects can only use strings as the key. And then you run into this scenario here. So the fact is when I'm actually passing in a number behind the scenes, it's coercing it to a string. And so by default, this isn't going to give us exactly what we want because we now have a map where the keys are strings instead of numbers. So I'm going to show you potentially what we should do instead. And ideally, we have an array that we then want to convert into a map. Because if we have that, then we can choose whatever we want as the key and specifically use the, the number value here for ID. So let's say you have this array of books and you want to construct this map. We can create an instance of the map. And then again, we need to pass in an array of key and values. In this case, we can just use the map method on arrays. Not to be confused with the map object itself. So map is a method on arrays that will return a new array of the same length for a given array. Given array. So let's say we say books.map. This gives us each individual book, but we want to turn this into an array that is a key and a value. We can pass in book.id and book. And so the result of this is going to be an array where the first value is the ID, the second value is the book. But because we pass that whole thing into the map, now you can see the inferred type has number as the key and then a book as the actual value. Now, whatever you end up doing, whether it's a map or a for each or a reduce, you're going to end up with a nice little map like this. And what's cool about this is we actually don't even need a custom method like we did before. So in the previous example, we had this get book function which we needed to call in order to get access to the book because we had to have this little guard clause here to make sure that this thing actually, the ID actually existed on the books by ID object. When you use a map, you don't really need any wrapper methods because you can just use those built-in methods. So here we can just say, get the book with ID 42. And you'll notice if we pass in a string, we don't actually get back the book. So it, it is using the specific type we set as the key here. And we don't run into the issue of prototype properties. So I can't ask for the constructor or the two string or, or, or anything like that. Now, one of the gotchas of using maps is the fact that they don't automatically serialize. So let's say we were to do json.stringify on this map here. You'll notice we just get back an empty object. And the implementation here is completely up to you, whether you're sending a map from your backend or you want to send a map to your backend. Ultimately, the native JavaScript way of representing this is with key value pairs in an array, right? So what we can do is before we stringify it is just turn it into an array of keys and values. So maps have this method on them called entries. And that's an iterator. So we need to spread it into an array here. And so if we do this now, when we stringify it, we're going to get an array of arrays where each of the keys is the first value in the nested array and each object is the second value in that nested array. And what's nice about serializing it in this way is it holds on to the type of the keys. Instead of like trying to turn it into an object and then stringifying the object, I would recommend stringifying it using the entries here because then you can reconstruct it back into a map very easily because like I showed earlier, you simply just pass in an array of arrays to get back the map object. Now let's take a look at where you might use a set. So a set actually comes from mathematics and it describes a collection of things. And one of the unique features of a set is that it can only have unique values. So you can think of a set kind of like an array, but it does have that, that property that only unique things can be put into that list or that collection. And so let's look at this code example here, or let's say you're trying to implement an add to cart function for like an online library or something like that. So you might have your cart object, you have your book IDs, and this is each ID of the book that has been added to the cart. And in this scenario, a user can only check out one of a specific book. You might have this is in cart method that takes in a book ID, and then you want to check, does that ID exist within that list of book IDs? And in this case, we're just using the includes method. Now, this is fine, but as this array starts to grow, this includes method actually has to check every single value in the array, and that's not ideal. And this is kind of like hiding the complexity here just by using the includes function. 
in the same the same follows if you use like filter or find it literally has to iterate over the entire array so if we were to actually implement kind of what's happening for includes it's it's literally a for loop it actually has to iterate over the entire array here so let's say we implement it with a for loop okay so we updated it to use a for loop instead and now you can really see well oh yeah it has to literally look at every single value in that array to determine if it's in the cart and the code's going to work the same down here but i just kind of want to show you that when you use includes or filter or find, you do have to think about the fact that it's searching over the entire array. Now with sets, we don't have to search over an array like this. And let me show you an example. So to kind of take a step back, let's actually look at how we would do this, not with an array, but even just with a built-in object. So let's say we don't wanna to have to search an array every time. If we instead convert this to an object. So let's say I have book IDs and it's an object where all of the keys are the ID. And then the value is just true that yes, this book is in, in this, this list here. So at this point, if I want to check to see is the book ID already in the book IDs object, uh, we wouldn't use includes because this isn't an array. We can just use object notation. So I can say cart.bookids at book ID. So if it's in there, it's going to return true. If it's not in there, it's going to return false. Now this will work. And this actually is a constant time lookup because we're literally just checking to see does the property exist on this object. And instead of using an array to search over it, uh, it's just a constant time lookup. Now, we run into the same issue as we did earlier, where if book ID is anything besides like an ID, if it's like a string constructor or the string to string or the string value of, we could run into some issues here. So again, we're going to have to wrap this in a guard clause to make sure that we're only looking at the properties of this, this specific object. But this would be one way of implementing it, just simply just using an object. But let's use a set. So the API for sets is super simple and it actually accepts an array as an argument. So if I create a new set here, now we can use the has method of a set. So instead of needing to search the array, we can just say book IDs has that specific book ID. And this method doesn't need to search the list. It's able to actually have a constant time lookup to see is the thing in the list. And so if you have this kind of code in your code base, it's actually a really easy replacement to stop using includes. Just put that thing into a set instead of a plain old array. And now you can start using the has method. Now, one of the other aspects of sets that I mentioned is that they only allow unique values. And so if I attempt to add the same thing twice, so let's just do cart book IDs. We're going to add 42 again. If we look at what's inside book IDs here, you'll notice 42 is only in there once. And uh, you just get that for free on sets. And so if you ever have some code where you're storing things in an array and then you're checking to see, well, is it already in the array? And if it is, then don't add it. With sets, you don't even have to have that check anymore. It's automatically going to deduplicate anything you put into the list. Now, there's a bunch of other methods on a set that you can use. And like I mentioned, sets come from mathematics and set theory. And there's actually methods that allow you to perform set operations. So you can do things like difference or intersection or union. So if you're doing mathy things in your code base, you can even get that benefit by, by using sets as well. But I highly recommend check out the MDN page. You can see the other methods and, and see the other types of things you can do with a set. Now, after hearing me talk about those things, hopefully you've identified some scenarios in your code base where you can use a map or a set instead. And that's really all I want. I'm not telling you to use maps everywhere or sets everywhere. There are certain scenarios where it's gonna be easier to use. It's gonna make your code easier to read and easier to maintain. Um, and overall, in some scenarios, much more performant as well. So like I said, if you have not heard episode 689 of Syntax, definitely go check it out where Wes and Scott dive deeper into using maps and sets and when and where to use them. That's all I have for you in this video. If you found it useful, if you've identified some scenarios where you use maps or sets, let us know down in the comments. Also, if there are things that I didn't talk about that you think people should know, let us know down in the comments as well. So yeah, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.